Welcome back everyone. This is video two for chapter 17, Groundwater. I left off on the first video talking about the porosity of sediment. Now I want to discuss the permeability. Permeability I like to describe as the interconnectedness of the pore spaces. It allows material to transmit a fluid if it is permeable. An aquitard is an impermeable layer, does not let water flow. Clay is an aquitard. An aquifer is a permeable rock strata that transmits groundwater freely. Sands and gravels make great aquifers. That's where you'd want to sink your water well if you had to have a well on your property. You may be asking how quickly groundwater moves. Well, imperceptibly slow. Average rate of four centimeters per day. An idea that groundwater exists as rivers flowing underground is a misconception. That is very rare. Groundwater is replenished in areas we refer to as recharge areas. And in discharge areas, that's where groundwater is flowing back to the surface of the earth. This is not typical groundwater. This is the misconception that there are big rivers everywhere underground and that's what groundwater is. That is incorrect. This figure is showing areas of recharge where water is going back into the groundwater system and areas of discharge where groundwater is going back to the surface. Once again, the reason these flow lines are curved is because they are seeking lower pressure. Let's say I have some groundwater that has been contaminated with a chemical, and I want to know how fast that groundwater is moving. We can use Darcy's Law to measure the volume of water flowing in an aquifer. The components of Darcy's Law include calculating hydraulic gradient, determining the conductivity of the material, and determining cross-sectional area of the aquifer. Think of the hydraulic gradient as the slope of the water table. The hydraulic conductivity can be determined, determined in a laboratory, or you can look up your type of material that makes up the aquifer, you can look up that value in a book and use that. And the conductivity takes into account not only the permeability of your material, but the viscosity of the liquid. And that determines then how quickly water is going to flow through that material. The slope or hydraulic gradient of the water table, here we are showing the height of the water table at position one, H1. You subtract it from the height of the water table at H2 and then divide it by the distance between H1 and H2. The extent of groundwater flow systems varies greatly. Some groundwater systems are regional and the flow of the groundwater can be quite deep and these are considered large groundwater systems. These light blue arrows are flow lines for the groundwater for near surface groundwater systems. The red represents deeper groundwater in subregional systems. And then finally, the black lines are groundwater movement in a regional system. If you live in a rural area and do not have access to municipal water, city water, you may re be required to drill a well. A well is a hole that's bored into the zone of saturation well below the water table because you do not want your well to go dry in a drought. If pumping of your well is significant you can actually lower the water table, and this is called drawdown. 
immediately around your well, a cone of depression will form in a groundwater system. Let's look at drawdown and cones of depression. Here we have two wells initially. Here's your water table. And then a new well that's going to pump a lot of water, a high capacity well, is constructed at this location. What happens because of the high volume of water that is being extracted from the aquifer is the water table is lowered and this cone of depression forms around the well itself. Notice what happens to these wells as a result. They are no longer usable. They are above the water table. These people would have to drill new wells deeper into the earth, which is quite costly. Sometimes you can put a well into what's called a perched water table. That situation is where you have an aquitard, which is not allowing the flow of water past it, and above it, the water is pooling in the pore spaces. Here is an example of a perched water table. Here is your aquitard, a shale, and this well is successful because there is groundwater sitting on top of this aquitard. This well, on the other hand, is unsuccessful. It missed the perched water table and they did not drill deep enough to get down into the main aquifer. Where this perched water table intersects the surface of the earth, you get springs that flow down the slope. You may have heard of artesian wells. Some artesian wells are flowing and some are not flowing. In order to be considered an artesian well, two conditions must be met. The water must be in a confined aquifer and the aquifer must be inclined to the earth's surface. Aquitards must exist above and below the aquifer and that is the confining portion. I mentioned that artesian wells can be flowing or non-flowing. In a non-flowing situation, the pressure, the water pressure surface or piezometric surface is below ground level. If the artesian well is flowing on its own, that means that the water pressure surface is above the ground. Let's take a look at non-flowing versus flowing artesian wells. First of all, the criteria to be met to be artesian is a confined aquifer. So this layer here, the brown above and below the aquifer, that makes it confined. The aquifer is also inclined to the Earth's surface, and this is where it's getting its water recharge from, just in this little area right here. Here's well one. Here's well two. At the top of the water in the well, at the, where the water level reaches in the well and the water table itself, if we draw a line and imagine this plane here, this is your water pressure surface. If your top of your well is above the water pressure surface, it is not going to flow on its own. You'd have to put a pump down in that well to get your water out. However, in situation two, you can see that the water pressure surface is above the top of the well. In that case, yes, the well will flow on its own. You would not need to put a pump down into that well. Some artesian systems transmit water great distances. An example would be in South Dakota. Municipal water towers are actually artificial artesian systems, and I'll show you a picture and explain that. Here we're looking at an extensive artesian system. We're going from west to east in South Dakota and crossing the Missouri River. Yes, it's out there as well. So here's the Missouri River. 
Here's our recharge area. Here's our confining layer, layers. And here's our aquifer, the Dakota sandstone and the Newcastle sandstone, and the Madison group. And so this meets all of the criteria for an artesian system, a confined aquifer that's inclined at one end to get recharged. Municipal water systems are artificial artesian systems. Here is our water tower. The reason that they're up in the air is so that the water pressure surface is high up in the air above all the homes. You do not have to have a pump in your house to get water uh, when you turn on your faucet. The reason that that is is because the water pressure surface is b above the water level being delivered to your house. So when you turn on the faucet, it just flows. The pressure causes the water to flow. So the tower acts as a recharge area. The pipes confine the aquifer. The faucets are the flowing artesian wells. I'm going to stop here for video two on chapter 17, groundwater, and discuss springs and hot springs in our next video on groundwater.